<laughs> ברוך השם, ברוך השם, בשם השם נעשה ונצליח. So this is, uh, this is great, a whole group of you, everybody's lovers of Hashem, I get the text messages, I get the, uh, the, I feel the love, I feel the love of Hashem from all of you, so it's truly amazing. It's actually also a, uh, another local convert that's going to, Bezat uh, Hashem, convert also in the coming, uh, soon, in the coming weeks, maybe month. Uh, so uh, I know that a lot of, everyone has a lot of questions, and I thought that it's a good idea to, uh, to answer as many questions as possible. There's no time restriction. As much time as you want, don't feel bad. Don't feel anything is inappropriate. Uh, don't worry about being politically correct, because I am not, and I don't think God is either. God is not politically correct. If you read his Torah, as I'm sure all of you have already, you see that Hashem is not really worried about being politically correct. He's only concerned about being correct and telling us the truth. So uh, there's no question that's... Uh, Silly, there's no question that's too much. Ask away as much as you want, and Bezat Hashem will try to uh, publicize uh, our, uh, you know, our, our question and answers, and uh, try to also help other people that are in a similar situation. You know, because one of the things that um, I wanted to share with you guys is, you know, the, the oral Torah is truly the, uh, the critical part of Judaism. You know, that's one of the, the main thing that the other religions have and even not secular Jews have a problem with, with Judaism, is not the uh, written Torah, not the story of the Exodus, or uh, the story of uh, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, uh, all the, uh, the 12 tribes. People love the stories. They've made movies about them, even though the movies are not exactly precise, uh, and in many cases not even close to the story. Uh, but... Um, People generally love the story of the of Am Yisrael, and uh, they don't usually have a problem with it. The main problem that they have is with the oral Torah, the part that was not written initially. That's why it's called oral because it was transferred from uh, you know father to son for generations and generations until Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, uh, they call him Rabbi, uh, actually put. It in writing, uh, and he put it into the Mish- Mishnah. It's called the Mishnah. But even before him, the first writing uh, that was done of the Oral Torah was by uh, Yonatan ben Uziel, Yonatan the son of Uziel. And uh, this is in a tractate of, uh, of Megillah, I believe, uh, when Yonatan ben Uziel wrote the first interpretation and uh, commentary, in essence, of the, uh, of the written Torah, there was a huge earthquake, and then a butt call, a heavenly voice came out and uh, said, Who dared disclose my holy work to the children of uh, you know, the, the mankind? And Yonatan ben Israel answered Hashem, and he said, It was me. Of course, obviously, Hashem knew. But what did he say? He said, It was me, and you know that I didn't do it for my own honor or for my father's honor. I did it for your honor because I know that as the generations are deteriorating, what's going to end up happening is that if we don't write this oral Torah, it's going to end up being lost. And he wanted to actually give even more. And he said, I want to write the rest of the interpretation, the rest of the secrets of the written Torah, the stuff that's behind the scenes. And Hashem said, no, you've done enough. Meaning that everything that we have already is not even a, 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 a big percentage of the truth. It's just we have a lot of it. But the, 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 the key is that um, after him, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi wrote the Mishnah. After that, they wrote the Gemara and so on. And, and this pretty much gives us the Oral Torah. Now, what's the Oral Torah? The Oral Torah is what actually is the essence of Judaism. Because if you notice, the written Torah, in a, you know, Hashem tells us to do all of these mitzvot, the 613 commandments, 613 mitzvot, which those 613 are all connected to the original 10. We had 10 commandments that we got on Mount Sinai, and the 613 are not in addition to the 10. And they're not even, the 10 are not part of the 613. What it is, is that the 10 break down into 613. 
So now we have 613 commandments, and we see that the complying with these commandments, Hashem tells us that if we comply with these commandments, we get a big reward, an eternal reward, just both in this world and the next world. But if we don't comply, we have a lot of problems. Hashem says there's also a big punishment. So now, you would think that, obviously Hashem knows that, let's say for example, Shabbat, the holy day of Shabbat, is a very critical mitzvah where Hashem says that someone, a Jew that violates the Shabbat, is no longer considered Jewish. Unless they repent and they start keeping Shabbat again. So now, obviously, to not keep Shabbat is, uh, is it's a big sin. But if you look at the entire written Torah, whether you're looking at the five books of Moses, or the prophets, or any of the other books of the written Torah, you will not find one place that tells you all of the details of how to keep Shabbat. Why? Because that's in the oral Torah. That's in the oral Torah, the details of how to keep all of the mitzvot, whether it's circumcision, or it's Shabbat, or it's the tefillin, or it's kosher, or all of the mitzvot, all 613 mitzvot, the details of how to actually execute them and how to do it is all in the oral Torah. So now, the non-Jews, or the secular Jews, the ones that don't want to keep mitzvot, or perhaps the Christians and the Arabs and so on, they don't have a problem with the story of Moses and Aaron and, uh, and Abraham and Jacob. They don't have a problem with the stories. What they have a problem with is with the oral Torah. And the reason why is because the oral Torah tells you the details of how to keep these mitzvot. And once you realize that keeping the connection between us and Hashem pure requires work, people immediately say, no, 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 it can't be true. It can't be true. Why do they say it can't be true? Because they don't want to do it. People want to go to the beach on Saturday. They don't want to go to the Knesset. They don't want to go to the synagogue. People want to eat whatever they want. They don't want to keep the kosher laws. So they say, listen, since all of the rules, the details are in this oral Torah, so if we reject the oral Torah, that's it. That means that we don't have to do anything. We could say that we believe in the written Torah, but we don't believe in the oral Torah. But in reality, one without the other is meaningless. It cannot be. The oral Torah and the written Torah were both given to us in Mount Sinai and we're obligated to learn and comply with both. That's why in the entire Torah you will see very often when Hashem says that uh, He gave us the Torah, He says He gave us the Torahs, plural. It's not one Torah, it's Torahs. So, and the reason for that is because there's more than one Torah, meaning that there's the written Torah is one part and the oral Torah is the other part. So that's a basic summary of the oral Torah. And the reason why I mentioned this in the introduction is because in one part of the oral Torah, it's called the Gemara, there are prophecies. And in the tractate called Avodah Zarah, which teaches us uh, a lot of the uh, different types and details about idol worship, and about what's going to happen in the future regarding idol worship, what's going to happen, to, what, how can we deal with it, how do we avoid it, how, you know, what kind there is. Back in, the, you know, in those days, 2,000 years ago, there are many, many more types than we have today. But in addition to the idol worship that it teaches us and how to, uh, how to deal with it, it also gives us a lot of interesting stories and a lot of interesting prophecies. One of the prophecies you will find in Tractate of Udazara is that on page 3b, you know, each page in the Gemara has two sides. There's side A and there's side B. And in page 3b, it says this. Rabbi Yitzchak says, in the name of, uh, Rabbi Yossi says, uh, Rabbi Yitzchak said, and I uh, gave this teaching, in the name of Rabbi Yossi, in the future to come, which he's referring to the uh, end of times or the times of Mashiach, the, idol, the idolaters will come and convert. The, uh, after this it says, but will, we con will, but will we accept converts among the nations at that time? 
why it has been taught in a Bereta, in another teaching, that we will not accept converts in the Messianic era. For Israel will then be ascendant, and would-be converts will be assumed to be acting out of ulterior motive. Similarly, we did, they did not accept converts during the time of King David, nor did they accept converts at the time of King Solomon. During those periods, Israel was an ascendant, meaning Israel was the leader of the world. So to explain what I just read, first of all, he's giving us a prophecy. He's telling us that at the end of time, there's going to be an extraordinary amount of people that will leave idol worship, will leave false religions, will leave all the nonsense that's in this world, and when it comes to the only truth that's available to us, which is Judaism, which is Torah. They're going to leave everything. Now, why, why is it going to happen now? Who are these people? At the time, the sages tell us that at the time of Mount Sinai, before Hashem decided to give the Torah to the Jewish people, He went to every single nation, and He asked their leader, which was a, uh, a, not only a physical king, but also an angel, if they wanted the Torah. So they said, well, what's in it? And he would tell them rules. And he says, you're not allowed to steal. So the nation of Edom, the, the people of Edom from Esav, said, no, stealing is part of our nature. We want to be able to steal whenever we want. So we can't accept this Torah of yours. So then he went to the nation of uh, Ishmael, which is where the Arabs come from. And he said, uh, you know, he said okay, what's in it? And Hashem said, you're not allowed to murder. He said, no, no, murdering for us is, uh, is part of our nature. We want to be able to hang somebody just because they, uh, you know, they uh, watch, you know, pornography. We want to murder them for that. We want to kill them. That's our capital punishment. And if somebody uh, says something wrong about the president, we want to kill him also. Which is, again, this is taking the law to an extreme. It's not, it's violating the Torah. So he said, so since your law and the Torah... Is not agreeable to us. We don't want to accept your Torah. And only people that accepted the Torah for what it was were the Jewish people. But within those nations of Edom and Ishmael, there were some people that wanted to accept the Torah. But they couldn't because their governments, their kings, didn't accept it as a nation. So you can't just leave the nation. They'll kill you. So Hashem made a promise to those souls. He made a promise to all of those souls and He said there will come a day where I will bring you back in a reincarnation and give you an opportunity to convert. I will give you an opportunity to convert and how could I give you this opportunity? By bringing you into an unusual situation where you're going to be born a non-Jew but you're going to have an unusual attraction to the Jewish people and its Torah. An unusual love for it. Sometimes even greater than the Jewish people themselves. Because sometimes the Jewish people themselves don't know what they have in their hands. You know, it's like sometimes there was this one time there was this guy that was praying to Hashem. You know, Hashem, please give me panasa, give me sustenance, give me money. I want to be able to buy a house for my family. I want to send my kids to a good school. I want to do this. I want to do this. And he would pray to Hashem every day. And you know, and he would pray he would outside, and he saw this good-looking rock, and he said, oh, let me pick up this rock as a memory for my prayer. And he would have this rock on his table. Every day that he would pray, he would look at this rock as a memory of the original prayer. And he's praying to Hashem, please, 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 Hashem, help me, please, Hashem, help me, give me sustenance. Little does he know that if he just washed, just washed a little water on that rock, he would realize that the rock was actually a diamond. A very big diamond. Meaning that Hashem did answer his prayer. He did give him what he wanted. He just didn't pay attention. And sometimes, unfortunately, Jewish people don't know what we have. Whereas the people that want to convert do see what we have. So it's a very unusual love that you have for the Torah and for Hashem. And it's extraordinary for me. It's very, very, uh, it's amazing to see it, truly. It's very motivating and it's, uh, it's amazing to see it. And Bezat Hashem, this will influence even more people to convert to the truth, more Jews to get back to Hashem. And uh, as you can see, 
This is the prophecy that Hashem promised. He promised your souls many, many years ago, 3,300 years ago approximately. But the second part of this, break, of this uh, Gemara said something that's very critical for everyone to know, anyone that's going to watch a video and see this, anyone that's watching it right now or listening to it, is that he's saying that, are we going to accept these converts all the time? And he specifically says, no. The time after the Mashiach, once the Mashiach arrives, no more conversion. Just like there was no more conversion at the time of David and no more conversion at the time of Solomon. Why? Because once Am Yisrael was number one in the world, where King David pretty much was the strongest king in the world at his time. King Solomon also. King Solomon had a wife from every one of the countries. So in essence, he had world peace. He had power, he had peace, he had wisdom. Same thing with King, with, uh, king David. Anyone that he went to war with, he beat them. So we had total control. So to go join the winning team, it's not, uh, it's not really such a big deal. It's not, you're not really sacrificing yourself to join the winning team. But to join the losing team, which unfortunately right now we are, it's not that you know, we don't see it technically now because it looks like Israel is a modern country and it's beautiful and it has a government and it has a lot of uh, money and so on. But in reality... We're not dominating ourselves. We're not ruling the world. We're ruled by the world. Before we shoot any missiles, we have to get asked permission. And that's not what a God, that's not what Hashem said that the Jewish people are supposed to do. He said the Jewish people are supposed to lead the world, not be commanded by the world and told what to do by the world. So as of now, we have an opportunity because the king is not here. The Messiah is going to be a king. He's not here yet. We have to, whoever wants to convert has an opportunity to do it now. Once the uh, Messiah comes, the door is closed because at that point, it's not, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to know whether you're doing it because you want to join the winning team or you're doing it because you love Hashem. Because if you love Hashem, it doesn't matter if the team is winning or not. It doesn't matter if the nation is le nation of leaders or not because you're changing the truth. But if... If it's the number one country in the world and everyone is its uh, is servants, slaves, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, helpers, obviously, you know, you want to be part of them. So now, everyone needs to know that Hashem has created everyone. And everyone has a purpose. Whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, you have a purpose. If you're Jewish, you have, in essence, a higher mission... You have a lot more commandments. You have 613 commandments. Not all of which we can comply with because some of them are just for men. Some of them are just for women. Some of them are just for the Bet HaMikdash, the Holy Temple. We used to have 2,000 years ago, but will be built when the Mashiach comes. The third one will be built. Bezat Hashem soon. So some of the mitzvot we can only do at the Bet HaMikdash. Some of the mitzvot are only for Kohanim. So in reality... No one person can do all 613, so no one needs to be scared. But each person is responsible for a good, I would say, I'm estimating this, probably around 25 to 30% of them. So I'll figure 150 to 200 of them is probably relevant to each one of us. But what you end up seeing is that many of the mitzvot are relevant to each other. So for example, there are rules of Shabbat, and there are 39 restrictions 39 things you're not allowed to do on Shabbat. There are many, many more things you are allowed to do. But if you're keeping Shabbat, that already means you're complying with 39 just on one day. So it's not like every day you have to do one, the next day you have to do two, three, and by the end of the year you only did half the mitzvot. In reality, you could do hundreds of them, you know, throughout a, in, in one week. But... The key is that the Jewish people are obligated to keep these mitzvot to the best of their effort. But not effort like, oh, listen, it's too hard for me not to drive on Shabbat, so I drive. No, that's not, that's not an effort. Effort means that you're truly trying to do your best, and in a genuine way, and realistically, one of the uh, 13 principles of faith, one of the 13 things that a person needs to believe in order to become Jewish, in order to be Jewish, is that Hashem knows what's inside us. He knows our thoughts. 
So Hashem knows if we're genuine or not. So if we're lying, we're only lying to ourselves because He knows the truth. So now we have these mitzvot that we have to comply with and as we learn them, because no one person immediately, you know, overnight knows all of these mitzvot, but there are mitzvot that we learn along the way. As soon as we learn them, we have to do our best to keep them and do better and better over time. That's genuine effort, but there are certain mitzvot that you have to know and you have to do from day one. For example, kosher. Kosher food. You have to eat kosher food all the time, not just in the house and not just when you go to a restaurant. All the time. You're only allowed to eat kosher food. Shabbat. You have to keep Shabbat. You're never allowed to use your phone on Shabbat or drive on Shabbat or light a cigarette on Shabbat or do any of the 39 restrictions unless... It's to save a life. Unless it's to save a life. So if let's say, for example, someone, chas v'shalom, you know, God forbid, someone uh, gets sick, a baby gets a, a, a high temperature, you're not only allowed, you're obligated. Not only allowed, because the Torah is to help us live, not to die. So you're obligated to take that baby to the hospital. And it's not considered a Shabbat violation. What happens? It's called pikuach nefesh. Pikuach nefesh means that there's life at risk. At that point, Shabbat is put on hold. It doesn't stop. You're not allowed to all of a sudden go play uh, PlayStation or uh, talk on the phone to your friends about the baseball game. That's not allowed still. You're allowed to take the baby or the person from where you are to the hospital. As soon as you get to the hospital and the baby is out of danger... Shabbat gets turned on for you, meaning that you can't drive back home. You have to stay at the hospital. So Shabbat is only put on hold. Why is it allowed for us to put Shabbat on hold? Because the sages explained to us, because Shabbat is actually even more important than life. Life is not, is not more important to, uh, than Shabbat. It's Shabbat is more important than life. So why can we stop, put Shabbat on hold to save life? Because the sages explained to us that if you put Shabbat on hold to save a life, he will live or she will live to keep many more Shabbats. So Shabbat is an obligation of every Jew. There is no haircut, there's no discounts, there's no uh, 50-50. Another rule that's obligation that's a, uh, very, very important, especially for women. Not, you know, it's, it's a critical, men also, but a critical, critical for women. Women must be modest. Must be modest. There are laws of modesty, not only for the way that they behave, but also the way that they dress. They have to dress in a way that is not overly attractive to the public. You could, be, you could look good, but you can't attract attention. You're allowed to, at home, with your husband, by yourself, wear whatever you want, do whatever you want. But to the public, as soon as you leave your house, or as soon as anyone else other than your husband sees you, you cannot dress as uh, what's common today. It's a very, very important for a woman to learn modesty laws and for a husband to learn modesty laws. And the reason why is because what our eyes see ends up being what our brain thinks. So a woman, when she looks at a man, she thinks about his personality. She thinks, oh, maybe he's a nice guy, or maybe he has a mean face, or maybe he looks funny. She thinks about the guy's personality. But if we call it how it really is, when a man looks at a woman, he doesn't care about her personality. The last thing on his mind is her personality. He's thinking about intimate things. He's thinking about how she looks without clothes. So now, if a woman walks around where she's not modest, she causes other people to think like that about her. Why is this a problem? Why is it her responsibility to care about what some guy that she doesn't even know thinks? Because that guy is also one of Hashem's creations. And Hashem is worried about every one of his creations. And if that guy, at the time that he's praying to Hashem, he's thinking about a half-naked woman, 
or he's thinking about a woman he saw at the beach, or he's thinking about a woman that wore tight clothes where he pretty much can visualize what she looks like naked, or he's thinking about a woman that is pretty much not covering her body like she's supposed to, then he's thinking about the woman. He's not thinking about Hashem. And that turns his prayer from being something that Hashem wants to something called to'ava. To'ava means disgusting. Hashem gets disgusted by his prayer because he's not praying really. He's just a robot saying words, but he's really thinking about having intimate relationship with some woman. That's not a good, that's not a good place to be in. The second reason why the woman has to, uh, has to be modest is because when she marries a husband, she is deciding at that moment that not only is her body, but her beauty only belongs to her husband. Which means that sharing her beauty with the rest of the world is violating the deal she made with her husband. The deals we make in life are very, very important in Judaism. Whether that deal is a covenant with Hashem, like the circumcision or the tefillin or Shabbat, that he calls those three things covenants or brit in Hebrew, or the deal that we make amongst each other. One person makes a deal with another person, I'm going to lend you money and you're going to return the money at a certain date. That person needs to return the money at a certain date or at that time come up and ask for an extension if he doesn't have the money. We can't just run away and say, no, no, he has a lot of money, he doesn't need my money back. Contracts and deals that we make in Judaism are very, very important. They're judged in heaven. A person that steals cannot enter the gates of heaven. Even if he complied with every mitzvah, if he stole... He cannot enter heaven. So, what does he have to do? He has to repent. If he has the ability to return what he stole, that's preferred. If he has no ability to return it, for example, the person he stole from died, he can give the money back to his family. If that person that died doesn't have family, then he can give the money that he stole to tzedakah, charity. So, there's always a way to repent for each one of our sins, and it's very, very important to repent for something we stole. Because even if we're completely righteous, we don't want to show up, Hey, Hashem, I did everything. It's like, yeah, you did everything except one thing. You stole 20 bucks from this guy. When you were 17 years old, you stole 20 bucks. You can't enter heaven. You have to come back to the world, fix that sin. You know, come back as a reincarnation. Fix the $20 sin and then come back here. Who wants to come back to this world to fix $20 sin? You know, so... Again, in, in, in Judaism, in the Torah, honesty is everything. Honesty is everything. So we have to comply with our deals. So when a woman makes a chupa uh, and kiddushin with a husband, she's making a deal that her beauty only belongs to her husband. The deal she has with Hashem is that she's not going to lead other people to sin. And it is her business. It is every Jew is responsible for every other Jew and even the, uh, the Goim. We're not allowed to, f to put Goim in a situation, non-Jews in a situation where they're sinning. So you can't say, listen, if I was in a city that only had non-Jews, can I walk around half naked? No. You have to be modest. Even if you are on an island by yourself, there was nobody else on the island, you still have to be modest. So it's very, very important for a woman to learn modesty laws. Modesty laws means the clothing. It means once they're married, they have to cover their hair, covering their hair with either a hat or a, some type of scarf, not a wig. Uh, the wig that's accepted by some people uh, amongst Judaism is a unfortunate misinterpretation of uh, parts of what the sages say. Uh, to go over it briefly, if anyone has a question about it, is that in the old days, they, uh, they actually said that some people wore wigs, but the wigs of, of those days were made out of straw because they didn't, have the, you know, they didn't have money or ability to cover their hair any other way. They had straw. So anyone that saw this woman with a straw on her head knew that it's a wig. 
Unfortunately, today's wigs look better than natural hair. And if anything, they make the woman even more appealing than if she did without the wig. So that's not the point of the wig. The covering her hair is what she does outside of the house. Once she's inside the house with a husband, she can walk around with no, no covering hair. Her husband can see her hair as much as he wants, play with it, do whatever he wants with it. Why? Because her beauty is for her husband. Not for, the, not for Joey and Steve from, from the supermarket. They're not allowed to see. So again, this is a little bit, a small taste of modesty in regards to women. Men have to pray every day. The morning prayer and the afternoon and evening prayer. They have to lay tefillin every day. That's the boxes, the black boxes that go on the arm and on the head. Every day. They have to learn Torah every day. Must learn Torah every day. Each person at his own level. Some people have a lot of free time. They can learn hours a day. Some people commit their entire life just to learn Torah. You don't need to learn Torah 100% of the day, but you must learn Torah every day. If you could do an hour a day in the morning, an hour at night, it's great. If you could do more, great. But you must learn Torah, especially in the beginning when you're learning a lot of these things. You cannot be righteous without learning Torah. There's no such thing as a righteous person without Torah. Why? Because righteousness can only be dictated and determined by the Creator. The Creator is the only one that knows what's righteous, what's not. He's the one that makes the laws. So if we say, no, I'm righteous, what makes you think you're righteous? Well, I'm a nice guy. What makes you think you're nice? Well, I don't steal. Okay, so the zebra doesn't steal either. So does that mean that she should go to Gan Eden also? She should go to heaven also? Oh, but I don't kill. Okay, the, uh, the, the dove doesn't kill either. So does that mean that she should go to you know, heaven also? Oh, I, uh, you know, I say hello to people. Okay, the monkey also says hello in the, in the zoo. The monkey says hello to everyone, just give him a banana. Does that mean he should go to heaven also? So, also we have to understand that our logic, our human logic is flawed. Everyone thinks they're nice. Everyone thinks they're perfect. Everyone thinks they're right. No one is, wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what, I can't wait to be wrong today. I can't wait to do bad things. No one thinks that. Even crazy people like Hitler, that killed millions and millions of people, he didn't kill them because he thought he wants to be the most evil person in the world. If you look at his book, he thinks that he's bringing a solution. He's helping the world by killing millions of people. So in essence, in his distorted mind, he thought not only is he not bad, he's actually doing the world a favor. Which shows us that if we leave everything to our logic, it becomes Gehenom in this world, becomes Sodom and Gomorrah. Because our human logic is flawed. The only logic that applies, the only logic that's true, the only logic that we know for sure is valid, is the manufacturer, the creator, God himself. So men need to study these laws because they have to teach the rest of the family. Women also need to study a little bit, but they don't have the same obligation as men. But they need to know basic laws. They need to know Shabbat. They need to know uh, family purity, uh, which is another thing that the women will uh, need to study. Family purity, which is uh, the times of the month that she's not allowed to be with her husband. There's part of the month that you're allowed to be with your husband as much as you want. And as part of the month that you're not even allowed to touch him, you're not even allowed to hold his hand. Why? Because that's a time that you're called nida. Nida it literally means impure, but it doesn't mean impure like you're bad, chas v'shalom, like God forbid, it's not mean that you're bad. It just means that there has to be a separation between the man and the woman because they cannot be intimate during that time. That's when, she has, when a woman has a period. Once the... Uh, Bleeding stops, which is usually after around four days, sometimes more, sometimes less, but usually it's around four days. She has to count seven clean days. So that's now we have a total of, let's say, 11. 
four bleeding days, seven clean days where every day she checks, she knows she's not bleeding for seven days. If she's clean for all, if you know, seven days, then she goes to the mikveh, which is a uh, uh, special pool that's comprised of mostly rainwater. 40% of it is rainwater. That's in a secluded place. No one else is there other than the woman that would help you. No one touches you. No one checks you like to your, you know, it's a very, very private and holy event. Takes a few minutes. You go there. She oversees to make sure that you're dipping into the water, which is exactly what all of you will do, Be'ezat Hashem, when you go to the conversion. You'll have to go in a mikveh. It's this pool of water. You'll have to go under the pool of water, dip into the water. Once the woman comes out of the, uh, uh, it's five days? That's it. Oh, five, okay. Um, once she dips in the, um, once she dips into the water, she comes out, she's allowed to her husband, as much as you want, have fun, bring babies to the world, enjoy. If there's time. If there's time. <laughs> but actually, by the way, it's good that you mention that. Remember I mentioned the, the, in the Ketubah, the marriage, marriage contract, right? So a woman has to be modest, has to help her husband, has to take care of the kids, but the man is obligated to support the, the wife. But there's several different types of support. There's monetary support. He has to clothe her. He has to put a, you know, food on the table, a house. But also, he has to be intimate with her whenever she wants. He, he's never allowed to say no. Ever. Now, obviously, in our mind, we're thinking, why would a man ever say no? But in the Torah, we already worried about it because sometimes somebody gets so deep into Torah, they learn Torah, they don't want to leave it. They fall in love with the Torah. It says, your wife wants you to be with her. You close the book, you go be with your wife. Torah takes precedent, the uh, wife takes precedent. So, the, the, uh, and again, obviously if she doesn't want to, he's not allowed to touch her. So, that intimate part of life, the wife controls, which she does anyway, but... The Torah says so anyway. So nothing changes there. Nothing really changes over there. It's just that the guys have another law to comply with. Uh, so uh, you have to be nice enough for us to want you. That's that's pretty much the uh, the situation here. Uh, so as far as the uh, laws for, for men, you have to pray, you have to learn. There's obviously uh, a few other things. Um... And the kids must go to Jewish school. They must go to yeshiva. You cannot send your kids to public school. I know this is a, uh, a difficulty for many because of money. But don't worry. There is financial help from different places that can help you. And also remember at all times that Hashem is the one that gives you sustenance. Not man. If you do what Hashem wants, He'll do what you want. You really send, you want to send your kids to a Jewish school because that's what Hashem said. He'll get you away to do it. You also have to live in a Jewish community. You can't be Jews by yourself in the middle of nowhere. Which means that unless you live in a Jewish community now, which that's not what I know, everyone will have to move. Alright, so uh, give me some questions, as many as you have. How are you doing? I'm, I'm saying. How are you, Baruch Hashem? Shalom, shalom. Um, more than anything, the first question that, that I had was regarding, you know, how you talk about in, in your, your lecture that we really appreciate and we learn, we learn so much about. It's the fact how we speak, or you speak especially, of Hashem having control of everything. Yes. You know, that we are supposed to accept that and which we do. You know, but Hashem, we do accept that now. We believe it. Uh, we follow by it. But at, at some point, um, we do, you know, amongst us as a couple, as my, this is my wife, Anna, as well, this is our nice mother, meet you. I introduce you, this is my mother, Lupita, nice as the last one, you know, yeah. kind of like a Brad Pitt, and then that's my sister, younger sister, Suan, Suan. and talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Ron. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's for us, especially that we're learning, it's kind of hard to get the whole grasp and concept of how we, we 
ink or you think some, sometimes even in the Torah where it has where it talks about different verses or in different situations. When they when they make choices, when you make a choice, do we are we do we have any free will whatsoever? Yes. Or really in control of everything, like for example, you know, in, in whatever situation there is and whatever we go through, whatever we've ever gone through even before learning Torah, has Hashem always had control of us completely, or do we make any Choices, any choices whatsoever. Absolutely, yes. So, uh, free will is a very, very important uh, topic, uh, very important to understand what uh, what we are. We're not robots. Uh, we're not, uh, Hashem is not just pressing buttons and uh, we're doing whatever He wants because then there would be no purpose for the creation. So, the uh, so in the uh, Torah it says, in the uh, oral Torah it says, um, everything is from heaven Except the fear of heaven, meaning that the outcome for events that happen in our life, outcome, is decided by Hashem, but whether we comply with what Hashem wants, meaning our actions, are up to us. So for example, whether we're born or not is not up to us, no one asks us. Whether we're male or female, no one asks us. And sex change doesn't count, even though it's acceptable in today's demented society. It's not, it's not, it's not, whether we're born male or female, it's not up to us. Uh, Whether we're rich or poor is also not up to us. Whether we find someone to get married to or not is also not up to us. What's up to us? What's up to us is how we choose to live our life. Meaning, we can choose to be righteous and do what the Torah says, or we can choose to be wicked and go against the Torah. We can choose to learn what the Torah says and comply with it, or we could just say it's a history book. So, our choice is in essence limited to our actions, but not the outcome. The outcome is decided by Hashem. So you have, so for example, a common, a common good example would be money. People always want to know, is it up to me whether, I, whether I'm going to make a lot of money or not, or, or is it not? Because people believe deep in their heart that if they work really hard, they'll make a lot of money. Now even though naturally it's supposed to work that way, in a, in a rational way, in reality, it's not. Why? Because you have plenty of people that work really, really hard and are poor as can be. And you have plenty of people that spend four or five days a week playing golf, but they make millions of dollars every month. So obviously, it's not based on hard work. Whether we're rich or poor, whether we you know, make money or not, is all decided based on Hashem. So now, you have to work, obviously, in order to survive. So what is up to us is, number one, how much effort we're going to contribute to work. Because we're not Moses, we can't live on waiting for miracles. Um, you know, we have to have some type of effort to make sustenance, to make money. But how much is up to us? Meaning that if somebody says, listen, I'm going to work 16 hours a day, 20 hours a day, which leaves them no time whatsoever for learning Torah, no time whatsoever to spend with their family, then that person, first of all, doesn't mean that he's going to get rich. He could be one of those people that works a lot, makes nothing. But second of all, which is even worse is that that person is pretty much saying that Hashem is not really the one that's giving him the uh, money. He has to do it. So Hashem wants us to exert effort, have some type of effort to make money, but not 100% of our time. So we have a regular, normal job. We work, I don't know, 8, 10 hours a day, whatever it is. But the rest of the time out of the 24 hours has to be spent with family, learning Torah, and doing the rest of the mitzvot. So... To show Hashem that we know that it's really coming from Him. But the part that we're doing is just to show, is to make things look natural. 
So our action is going to, is dictated by us. We decide what our action is. What the outcome is going to be, Hashem decides. Whether you're, that job that you work on for one hour, whether that's going to end up uh, resulting in a million dollar contract or not, Hashem decides. Whether you'll make the phone call or not, that you decide. Uh, the uh, the other thing is also in regards to all of our uh, uh, our free will. We need to understand that uh, free will is not exactly what we think for it to be, meaning that it's not free will. Like if we do what Hashem wants, everything is good. If we don't do it, then it's no big deal. Like, people think free will is that if you do it, you get a bonus. You don't do it, you get nothing. That's not free will. That's not the free will we have. We have, we have choice, meaning that if we do what Hashem wants, we get rewarded. If we, do, if we don't do what Hashem wants, we have punishment. Or is that overall over all humankind? Is that oh, everyone has, everyone has. Is punished or is it just Judaism where, you know, if, if, if you can go to courts and you follow Hashem, you, you get rewarded, if you don't, you get punished. Or is that overall? Everyone has, there's a reward and punishment for all of creation, but the Jewish people have more restrictions. So, and but the non-Jews have... Worse punishment in some cases. So to explain it is, uh, and then I'll answer your question. So, for example, if a, uh, a Jew has many more things that they're not allowed to do than a non-Jew. So a non-Jew is allowed to eat whatever meat he wants. As long as it's a dead animal, he's, uh, you know, he's not allowed to eat an uh, animal while it's still alive. But he's allowed to eat pig, he's allowed to eat whatever meat he wants. A Jewish person is only allowed to eat kosher food. And there's laws of kosher. Now, on another hand, the, uh, if a uh, Jew violates the kosher law, there's a heavenly punishment on them unless they repent. On the other hand, if a non-Jew violates one of the seven Noahide laws, even if it's stealing... Steal, like for example, if a Jew stole a hundred dollars, they have to return two hundred. That's the punishment. A Jew stole a hundred, they have to return two hundred. But a non-Jew, a non-Jew that stole a hundred, the punishment is death penalty. So the punishment on a non-Jew is worse in some cases, even though they have le- less laws. The punishment for them is worse. So people shouldn't necessarily run, run to being a Noahide just because it has less laws because the punishment is worse in some cases. The reward, on the other hand, for a Jew is greater than the reward for a non-Jew. Even though both of them can go to heaven, both a, a righteous Jew and a righteous Noahide can both go to heaven, the level of heaven that a Jew can get to that's righteous is higher than a non-Jew. So there's a bigger responsibility for a Jew, but there's also a bigger reward. There is less responsibility for a non-Jew, but there's also less reward. So it's measure for measure. But how about when you said that even when you're a non-Jew and you're studying Torah, you're considered in heaven as a Kohen Gadol, yes. you're not a Jew. Yes. Okay, so how would that work when you said right now that it's, even though you're a non-Jew, it's less of heaven than when you're a righteous more in heaven. When you're right now, like for example, us that we're not Jews, you know, we haven't, we haven't converted, but we're, we're following, we're studying Torah. Right. Remember, he said in lecture, what, uh, lecture sure, number 82, I think, was? Mm-hmm. He, I mean, we're talking about when a non Jew uh, studies Torah and follows Torah, you know, right? Yeah, it's, you're considered in, in, in heaven, I believe I understood. It's right. here. You had considered a coin gadol. You're considered in the same level. As a Kohen Gadol, meaning because you're not obligated to learn Torah like a Jew is, but when you're learning Torah to such a high level, you consider the ultra-righteous. 
So yes, but even in heaven, there are levels. There's not just one heaven. There's levels of heaven. There's degrees. So uh, a standard normal Jew will go to one level. A ultra-righteous Jew will go to a higher level. Uh, someone that, you know, so there's different levels of heaven. But the, uh, uh, there's been very, very righteous non-Jews in history. For example, one of them is uh, Job. Job was not only a non-Jew, he was also a prophet. But he obviously has uh, received a bigger award both in this life and in the next world. He's very, very righteous. But has also been non, you know, you know, wicked non-Jews and wicked Jews. In the Torah, outside of it, and so on. So each person is judged based on what the Torah dictated. And everyone is judged measure for measure. There's some punishments that come in this world. But most of the punishment and reward come in the next world. This world is really meant for us to do work. This world is meant for us to collect mitzvot, to do good deeds, uh, as the Torah said, and to prepare ourselves for the real world, which is the one after this. So when people spend all of their time looking for pleasure in this world, it's impossible for them to have a good world in the next world because they're not spending any time preparing for the next world. You had a question? Um, yes. Uh, right now that you were mentioning um, about the... That there's some that will work uh, a thousand hours and will still be needing. Yes. Will we, we ever... Is there a way that we'll know... Uh, like, let's say, if, 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 we're, if we're one of those people... Or, they're meant to be rich or poor. Yeah, they're meant to be rich or poor. <clears throat> is there any way that we can change that? Sure. Yes. Yeah. The uh, your there are certain things that you can do, uh, certain prayers, uh, certain different things that you can do in order to help uh, sustenance, in order to help money uh, and, and and making a living. Um, and uh, there's more possibilities of being able to do it as a Jew than there is as a non-Jew. Uh, and um, yes, there are definitely things that you can do. In order to help that, as a matter of fact, there's one thing uh, that uh, Hashem told us that we're allowed to test Him. We're not allowed to test Hashem in anything. Like, for example, we're not allowed to say, Hashem, if you really exist, give me a sign right now. Make a, I don't know, a lightning or something like that. We're not allowed to do that. Or look for signs from Hashem. We're not allowed to say, Hashem, if you really exist... Do something. We're not allowed to do things like that. We're not allowed to test Hashem. There's only one thing that Hashem said we are allowed to test Him, and He's actually inviting us to test Him. And it says, Maser v'tit asher. Maser is tithed, 10%. Uh, Hashem said that if you give a 10% of the net income, not gross. So for example, if somebody makes, I don't know, let's say if they make uh, $3,000 a month, and their bills are 2000 and they have $1,000 left. So that $1,000 is what I'm talking about, not the 3000 So the tithe, the maser, he says, if you give 10% of that what's remaining to tzedakah, but not just any tzedakah, not to uh, somebody that's a gambler that just needs more money to go play blackjack. You give it to somebody that's learning Torah, you give it to somebody that's helping Jews. You give it to a real good a Torah cause. If you do that, I, Hashem says, I guarantee that you will be rich. Not just have money, you'll be rich in your lifetime. He doesn't say timing though. So let's not, I don't want anyone to misunderstand. He doesn't say, listen, you do it for a year, I guarantee the next year you'll be rich. He doesn't say that. I know personally one guy that did it for maybe a year. And became very, very wealthy. I know another guy that did it for maybe uh, 10 or 15 years. Before he became wealthy. So there's no measure. There's no... Hashem decides when. Each person has their own test. I know that the younger guy, the guy that got rich quickly, he was much younger. Which I'm not God or anything, but I know that he would not have held up to that test for 15 years. He would have not have given 10% for 15 years waiting to become rich. Why? Because a guy that's 25 years old doesn't have the patience of a guy that's 45 or 50. 
So Hashem also told us He's not going to give us tests that we can't pass. So that's one thing in regards that to uh, for for sustenance that can help us. That Hashem Himself, it's in the Torah. Hashem Himself said it, not me or anything like that. Another thing is to uh, there's a blessing called Birkat Amazon, which is the uh, blessing you do after you eat bread. Anytime you eat bread as part of a meal or even just bread by itself, there's something called Birkat Amazon, which you're obligated to say anyway. Now that blessing, if you have a lot of kavana, a lot of meaning in that blessing, it uh, the sages say it's a skula, it's a uh, it, it can give you extra sustenance, extra money. Uh, and there's a few other things. There's a few other things we can go over another time. But uh, there's there's several things that uh, Hashem and this you know gave us through his sages and even through himself that can help us have an easier time making a living. The most important thing out of everything is having emunah, having faith in Hashem that He's in control of everything. As long as we have faith in Him, we'll never have anything to worry about. Which means that anytime we're worried, that means we have a lack of faith. And we have to work on it. I recall one of your lectures that you mentioned that, um, uh, that that's how... First thing where where when we start uh, spending more time reading the Torah and learning, then the first thing that we start losing is is, is that either it's health or it, and then it's uh, money and and it's, it's I mean it's yeah, it yeah. and it's exactly like it's exactly what you were saying in that lecture was exactly what we were we were going through and the more we try and and the more we do more lectures, the more we, we spend more time, it's exactly what, what, you're, what you said. I mean, that's what we're going through. This is the test. This is the test. Listen, you right now, you're all doing something amazing. You're doing something that's unusual. You're doing something that's truly unbelievable. You're join, you want to join the, uh, and you're going to join Be'ezat Hashem, you're going to join the chosen people. You're going to join... A nation that's very, very few in number. And technically, if you compare the Jewish people in comparison to the rest of the world, we're not even a statistical error. There's 7.5 billion people and there's only 14, 15 million Jews, of which out of those 14 or 15 million, is only about 3 or 4 million that actually keep the, uh, the Torah. So 3 or 4 million out of 7.5 billion people, we're not even a rounding error. And you're about to join them. So... That's something special. The, it's not going to be, it cannot be something so, such a huge milestone cannot be done in, in an easy way. Hashem can't say, oh, listen, you want it, so I'll let anybody in. Just like, for example, if somebody wants to be a doctor and uh, they say, listen, you want to be a doctor? Okay, uh, what's your name? Steve. Okay, you're a doctor. If that was the test, somebody would say, why'd you make me go to uh, medical school for 10 years if you just ask me my name? So the more difficult, the more significant the reward, or the more significant the goal is, the more difficult the test is going to be. But I can promise you from experience and knowledge that it's worth it. It's worth it because it's an eternal reward. By the way, there's a chance that the battery is going to die on his phone. I have to find a solution to that because it keeps giving me an er a uh, message that it's running out of battery. So hold on a second for me.